We cannot go on being dumb as we want to be. And right now, that is the motto of the US Congress. Dumb as we want to be. Okay. Washington today is brain dead. I am talking about beep. There isn't even a beep. OK. Brain dead. As far as I'm concerned, both parties, both houses, the White House, brain dead. But I have to tell you, as someone who is a reporter who spends a lot of time out in the country, thank God our country is alive. Because all these individuals, I should show you my desk, but I got a pile here from energy entrepreneurs. Come see my flywheel. It turns a duck. It jumps up. It makes you know, methane. I mean, come to my class. Another pile from educators. We're teaching young women how to do science and math in these really innovative ways. Thank God our country is alive. If we had a government that was as alive as the country, no one would touch us. So I'm not ready to cede the 21st century to anyone just yet because our culture of creativity, it's hard to duplicate. My grandmother in Minnesota had a saying, Grandma, Grandma Friedman, God bless her, she used to sit in her rocking chair in the dead of winter, and she would say to me, you know, Tommy, I, I have to tell you, remember one thing, said Grandma Friedman, never cede a century to a country that censors Google. <laughs> so it, was, it was just a... It was, it was just a little thing grandma used to say and <laughs> sitting, sitting by the fire. So I'm not ready to cede the 21st century yet to anyone. But I think a lot of who is going to own the 21st century, and I'm going to close with this, is really going to be defined by who addresses this clean power challenge, this clean energy challenge, first, best, and most productively. And that's really the segue to my next book. Because when the world is this flat, what's happening is three billion new players, God bless every one of them, have come through, through, through portals like this to the flat world, all with their own version of the American dream. A house, a car, a toaster, a microwave, and a refrigerator. If we don't find a cleaner, more non-emitting way to power their dreams, we are going to burn up, choke up, heat up, and smoke up this planet so much faster than even Al Gore predicts. OK. So the flattening of the world is critical to this. Now, everyone says, you know, oh, but, but, but Mr. Friedman, there's a green revolution going on. There's a green revolution going on. I read it in the special green issue of my local magazine, my local newspaper. Special green issue even of Amtrak's magazine. I say, oh, really? Really, there's a green revolution going on here. You, you don't say, really, a green revolution? Have you ever been to a revolution where no one got hurt? That's the green revolution. Yeah, the green revolution we're having is a revolution where nobody gets hurt. You get to consume your way out of it. Oh, th th that's not a revolution, friends. That's a party. We're having a green party. And it's, it's great fun, I have to tell you. I get invited to all the parties. It's great fun. I've never been to a revolution where no one got hurt. Many of you here attended drove and participated in the IT revolution. That was a revolution. It operated on the true business revolutionary principle, change or die. Change or die. Wayne Computer, Data General. Burroughs, they're not with us anymore. They're in that great computer company, heaven in the sky, because they were in the middle of a real revolution. Change or die. The green revolution we're having is a complete fraud, as far as I'm concerned. Because in this revolution, everyone's green. Yeah, Exxon's green, BP's green. I read there, eh, the Beyond Petroleum. GM's green. Now they give you a little yellow cap, you know, on, uh, to put your flex fuel in. They don't tell you you're driving a flex fuel car, but never mind. That's not a revolution. That's a party. 
And if we don't do what it takes to spark a real revolution in a flat world, the climate and energy impacts are going to swamp us. I wrote about this a few weeks ago. Some of you may have seen. By accident, I happened to visit two cities you've probably never heard of two weeks apart. I went to Iraq, and on my way, I stopped in Doha, Qatar, capital of Qatar, a tiny peninsular state off the east coast of Saudi Arabia. And 10 days later, I went to Dalian, China. Now, I happen to have been to Doha and Dalian several times, but I hadn't been to either one for three years. I go to Doha, and what do I find? I find I get off the plane, I look downtown, and they have grown a Manhattan, a little mini Manhattan, since I was there last, like a wildflower that sprouted from a desert rainstorm. I just looked, I said, that, you, you have a skyline now. That's like, that's like a little Manhattan. Two weeks later, I go to Dalian. Ten days later, I see they already had a Manhattan. They've added two more since I was there. So I'm really glad you changed all the CFL, your lights here from incandescent to compact fluorescent. Doha and Dalian ate that for breakfast. Oh, no, you got a Prius. God bless you. Doha and Dalian ate that for lunch. Oh, you added more insulation to your home. You did the 205 easy ways to go green, according to Working Woman magazine. <laughs> Doha and Dalian snacked on that after dinner like so much popcorn. Two cities you've never heard of have grown Manhattans in the last three years. The global economy today, friends, is like a monster truck with the gas pedal stuck, and we have lost the key. And the only way we are going to catch that truck is with a disruptive breakthrough. And the only way we're going to get a disruptive breakthrough is with a completely different mix of standards, regulations, incentive, and taxes that will trigger that disruption. Which is why my fundamental rule is change your leaders, not your light bulbs. Oh, it's great to change your light bulbs. But if you don't change your leaders, if you don't change the leaders who write the rules, who trigger the innovation, we are cooked. So what I've been trying to do in the new book I'm writing um, is basically in my own little way, to try to reshape how we think about this problem. Because we actually think we're having a revolution, and we're actually having a party. But one of the real problems in getting people to rethink this problem is getting them to rethink the meaning of green. One of the big problems around green is that I'm a big believer to name something is to own it. If you can name an issue, you can own an issue. The world is flat. And the problem with green is all these years, it was named by its opponents, basically. They named it liberal, tree-hugging, sissy, girly man, unpatriotic, vaguely French, just vaguely French. <laughs> Something about it, vaguely French, OK? Well, what I'm really out to do is to rename green. Rename it geopolitical, geostrategic, economic, capitalistic, entrepreneurial, patriotic, green is the new red, white, and blue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.